Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash great detectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you've not already, I do want to encourage you to check out my ebooks, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo, and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. Each ebook examines the life and history of a great fictional detective and policeman and life lessons that can be learned from them. It is available as an audiobook through the Apple Store or through Audible.com and wherever fine ebooks are sold. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Mr. Chameleon. The original air date, January 5th, 1949, and this one is The Rich Uncle Murder Case. Next, Mr. Chameleon and The Rich Uncle Murder Case. Tonight, we again present the famous Mr. Chameleon of Central Headquarters in his most famous cases of crime and murder, brought to you by the makers of genuine Bayer Aspirin. Now let me tell you just who Mr. Chameleon is. A college man, he tried from childhood to live up to the name he bore, Chameleon, by taking on the color of whatever situation in which he found himself, appearing in endless guises, finally entering the police force where he became known as Chameleon, the man of many faces, the underworld's most dreaded man. The listener invariably knows who Mr. Chameleon is, no matter which disguise he assumes, but the criminal he's tracking down seldom does. Tonight we give you Mr. Chameleon in The Rich Uncle Murder Case. It is difficult in your old age to have to live with your relatives, and no one knows it better than Captain Silas Harper. But he's a shrewd and colorful old seaman, and he has no qualms about using the one weapon left to him, his money. And now in the little parlor of the Flaubert's New York flat, he smiles a trifle maliciously at his niece Harriet and her husband Flaubert, and he says, Harriet, you're very good to your old uncle. Very good indeed. You too, Flaubert. It's nice to have a snug harbor to come to every year. Show you how grateful I am. Here's something for you. What is it, Uncle Silas? It looks like a will. (laughs) You got a smart husband, Harriet. He knows a will when he sees one. (laughs) Oh, but Uncle Silas, you don't mean... Don't drool, Harriet. Yes, I've left you my entire fortune. A state, I guess you landlubbers would call it. Uncle Uncle Silas. Uncle Silas, you've left us your entire fortune. Oh, bless your heart. You're a good man, Uncle Silas. Yeah, thank you, Flobot. That's the first time I've ever been called that. We can never thank you enough. This is your home for as long as you live. Oh, oh, but what about Lucy? Lucy? Yes. My little niece? My little chickadee with the light brown hair? Well, what about her? Uncle Silas, she's not sincere. She's always making up to you, but she doesn't really love you at all. Then you'll appreciate the joke that I'm playing on Lucy. (laughs) I'm leaving her a hundred dollars and my china clock. Your china clock? The one you put up there on the mantel? Yep, my wonderful old clock that I take with me everywhere. My beautiful china clock with the cherubs painted on it. (laughs) Lots of people think it's an eyesore, especially Lucy. And... That's what you are leaving to Lucy in your will? (laughs) That is priceless, priceless. Oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard of, Uncle Simon. I thought it would amuse you. I think I'll like a little air. find it kind of stuffy in here. But, Uncle Silas, you can't go out this hour of the night. There's a terrible fog. Fog? You think I'm scared of a little fog? 
Me, who sailed every body of water on this planet? <laughs> I'm going down to docks. I'll be back around midnight and... Oh, oh don't worry about my health. <laughs> oh, I don't, Uncle Silas. You'll outlive all of us. Good night. Well, <clears throat> I suppose it's worth it if he leaves us all his money. Oh, but that terrible clock alone, it'll ruin the whole house. Quiet, quiet. He may overhear you. Hmm. Well, frankly, I don't believe he'll outlive all of us. Harriet, surely you wouldn't do that. Who said I'd do anything, Flaubert? <laughs> And Harriet Flaubert proved to be quite a prophet. For the following morning at Central Headquarters, we find Mr. Chameleon, the great detective, sitting in the office of the Commissioner of Police. And the Commissioner is saying... Yeah, the poor old man was stabbed in the back, Chameleon. A couple of sailors found his body about 1 a.m. down near Pier 61. Whoever murdered them must have sneaked up behind him in the fog and struck him down. Oh, that's too bad. Captain Silas Harper was a legend, the Mm. last of the old sea captains. Where is the body now? At the home of his niece, Harriet Flaubert. There's a nephew, too, in New York, Thaddeus Harper. A ship's chandler. Uh, sells ship supplies. Mm. Well, I suppose they're all of them grief-stricken. The old man must have left plenty. Well, I'll get right over there and question them. I'm Chameleon of Central Headquarters. Here to ask some questions in connection with the murder of Mrs. Flaubert's uncle, Captain Silas Harper. Oh, come in, Mr. Chameleon. I am Mr. Flaubert, Captain Harper's nephew by marriage. Harriet, it's Mr. Chameleon. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, it's so awful to think that poor Uncle Silas, that he should have died like that all alone. I doubt if he minded that as much as he minded dying. <laughs> you are very hard, Mr. Chameleon, but then you are a cop. I am simply determined to find Captain Harper's killer. Mrs. Flaubert? Yes. Who survives him besides yourself, his niece, and a nephew, Thaddeus Harper? Well, there are two other nieces, one in New Zealand and one in California. And, of course, cousin Lucy Billingsley. She's an orphan. She lives here in New York. And who are Silas Harper's heirs? We are, Mr. Chameleon. That is to say, my wife Harriet is. You are his sole heir, Mrs. Flaubert? Yes. Uncle Silas himself gave me his will last night. It's right here. He gave it to you last night, just before he was murdered. Very convenient. What do you mean by that? I mean I want to know exactly where you and your husband were last night at the time your uncle was murdered. I was in bed, that's where. I was here too. Is that correct, Miss Flaubert? Your husband was here with you? I don't know where he was. I was asleep. Well, what are you trying to do to me, Harriet? Tell this man Chameleon the truth. There's the doorbell. Flaubert, answer it. Oh, very well. Mr. Chameleon, Uncle Silas left everything he had to me, oh, except a hundred dollars to Cousin Lucy and that clock there on the mantel. But I had nothing to do with his murder. This china clock here? Yes. Isn't it hideous? But Uncle Silas loved that clock. He took it everywhere with him. <laughs> Wait till Lucy hears that's all she gets in his will. Flaubert, I am heartbroken. I am simply heartbroken. Who's that coming in? That's my cousin, Thaddeus Harper. The one who sells ship supplies. Uh, How is his business, incidentally? Very bad. I'm sure he was counting on Uncle Silas to pull him through. Well, Thaddeus? Harriet, Harriet, this is terrible news. You notify Cousin Esther in California, Cousin Myra in New Zealand? Yes. Yes, I wired them both. Oh, uh, Thaddeus, this is Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective. Oh, glad to meet you, Mr. Chameleon. Thank you. Hope you're looking for Uncle Silas's killer. Uh, naturally. Mr. Harper, were you very close to your Uncle Silas? Close? <laughs> so close that he left me all his money. What? What are you saying? Are you crazy, Thaddeus? He left it all to me. Well, you're the one who's crazy, Harriet. He gave me his will, told me to put it in a safe place. He left his whole fortune to me. Two people, each claiming the murdered man left everything to them. Very interesting. I don't understand it, Mr. Chameleon. There's the doorbell again. Flaubert, answer it. Thaddeus, is this a joke? Uncle Silas couldn't have left you his entire fortune. Have you the will, Mr. Harper? Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Chameleon. Here's the will. Well, well, may I see it, please? 
Yeah. Well, this will seems in order, Mr. Harper. Let me see it. Why, it, it's just like the one Uncle Silas gave me. Was it dated the same day, Mrs. Flaubert? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chameleon. And it's, why, it's worded the same way. Bequeathing all my stocks and bonds and all my cash in the bank... All my ownership remaining in any shipping company. Oh, here is a telegram. All right, Flaubert, open it. That is, I'll fight you in every court in the land. Well, go ahead, Harriet, you bloodsucker. You haven't a chance to win. Uh, Mr. Flaubert, what's in that telegram you're reading? You have a very strange expression on your face. Mr. Chameleon, I, I do not understand. Oh? Harriet, listen. It's from Cousin Esther in California. She says, grieved at Uncle Silas' death, I have his last will and testament bequeathing his whole fortune to me. What? She's crazy. Or Uncle Silas was crazy, or... Um, Mr. Chameleon, what are you grinning at? I was just thinking, Mrs. Flaubert, in a case like this, it's always rather difficult to tell who is crazy, but I don't think it was your Uncle Silas. Meanwhile, I am concerned with finding his murderer. I might as well tell you that every one of you has a perfect motive for murder. See what you have done, Harriet. But now I'm going to question Captain Silas Harper's other niece, Lucy Billingsley. Yes, question her, question her. I uh, might as well take her the ugly old china clock which her Uncle Silas will do, don't you think so? Yes, yes. Get that terrible thing out of the house. And Mr. Chameleon does take the ugly old china clock to Lucy Billingsley. And we find him now with Lucy in her living room. She is saying... I couldn't believe it, Mr. Chameleon. Uncle Silas was so alive. I I can't believe he's gone, that he's been murdered. You sound as if you were really fond of him, Miss Lucy. I was. Underneath his bluster, he was very warm and kind. You can still say that when all he left you in his will was a hundred dollars and this... Hideous clock, this perfect monster of a clock. I didn't want anything from him. What about that note that you said you received from him this morning? Uncle Silas must have mailed it yesterday, Mr. Chameleon. He spoke of this china clock. He said if it got too much on my nerves, I had permission to smash it after six weeks. That is strange. That's very strange. Mr. Chameleon? Uh, Yes, Dave, come on in. That's Detective Sergeant Arnold. Well, Mr. Chameleon, we caught this character here. He was seen hanging around the waterfront following Captain Silas Harper last night. Oh? His name is Marcus Smith, so he says. That's my name, right enough. Oh. You've an accent, haven't you? What is it, um, Australian? No, wait, uh, New Zealand. So what does that prove? That don't mean I murdered a man, does it? No, indeed, Mr. Smith. You have a very strange color. Did you get out of prison recently? Well, answer me, did you? Yes, I did. That don't prove I'm a murderer either, comedian. What were you in for? Well, nothing to say. What were you in prison for? Uh, Assault and robbery. But I'm trying to make a fresh start. That's why I came to this country. Why were you following Captain Silas Harper? Why? Wait a minute, Miss Lucy. Uh, Didn't your Uncle Silas have another niece in New Zealand? Yes, of course, Mr. Chameleon. Her name's Sally Harper. Marcus Smith? Did you know Sally Harper? Well, you might as well tell me. We'll only find it out in the end. Yes, I'm a foster brother. But so help me, Mr. Comedian, I had nothing to do with Captain Harper's murder. Why would I? What was there in it for me, eh? I am not sure, Marcus Smith, but I have a pretty good idea. Dave, you take him to central headquarters and hold him for questioning. Mr. Chameleon, we can't get a thing out of Marcus Smith. He still swears he had nothing to do with Captain Harper's murder. But does he still swear there was nothing in it for him, Dave? Because if he does, he is lying. I wired Miss Sally Harper, Captain Harper's niece in New Zealand. I received a return wire telling me that she was Captain Harper's sole heir. He gave her his will, too. What? So Marcus Smith did have a motive for killing Captain Harper. A cut of the old man's estate. Yes, that's right, Dave. The canny old devil. (laughs) Captain Harper giving all four of them identical wills, leaving each one his entire fortune and making himself welcome wherever he went. And making himself a target for murder, Mr. Chameleon. You know, Dave, what seems so strange to me is that Lucy Billingsley, the only decent one of the lot, all she got was that china clock. Dave! What's the matter? 
I am going to see Lucy Billingsley. It just occurred to me that Captain Harper might have had a reason for leaving her that clock. And my idea, Miss Lucy, is for you to break open your Uncle Silas' china clock. But, Mr. Chameleon, I can't. Uncle Silas adored that clock. Miss Lucy, was your uncle a sentimental man? Well, no. No, he certainly was not judging from his actions. But I believe that he loved you. I also believe that he had no sentimental attachment at all for that clock. But, Mr. Chameleon... Now, we can't open the clock. The back is being soldered on. The only thing to do is to take this hammer and break it. You think that... That breaking this china clock will help you find Uncle Silas's murderer. It may, in a sort of roundabout way. Then I'll do it, Mr. Chameleon. Good, good. Here's the hammer. I hate to, but here goes. <gasps> oh, Mr. Chameleon! Mr. Chameleon! Good heavens, this is amazing. Even though I half expected it's amazing. Miss Lucy... You must promise me that you won't tell anyone what we found in this clock. Now, if you value your life, you won't tell anyone. Mr. Chameleon and the Rich Uncle Murder Case continues in just a moment. Don't let a cold cause you needless suffering. In spite of what some people think, you can relieve painful cold symptoms and relieve them fast. Because Bayer aspirin is ready to go to work in two seconds, that headachey feeling and muscular aches and pains are quickly relieved when you take two Bayer tablets with a full glass of water. And you can take Bayer aspirin to combat sore throats arising from colds, too. Just as all three Bayer tablets in one-third of a glass of water and use as a gargle. With astonishing speed, this highly potent medicinal gargle will soothe the irritated membranes of your throat, quickly relieving pain and irritation. So when you're suffering painful cold symptoms and accompanying sore throat, first take two Bayer aspirin tablets with a full glass of water, and then gargle with three Bayer tablets dissolved in one-third of a glass of water. When you buy, ask for Bayer aspirin, not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. And now, back to Mr. Chameleon and the Rich Uncle murder case. Mr. Chameleon, the famous detective, is trying to track down the murderer of a wealthy old sea captain, Silas Harper, who was found stabbed on the waterfront. It is a few hours after Chameleon has broken open the hideous china clock belonging to the murdered man. He is now at the home of Harriet Flaubert and her husband, two of the suspects in the case. As he enters, Flaubert says excitedly, Mr. Chameleon... I tell you, my wife is insane. She is trying to pin this murder of her uncle on me, an innocent man. The woman is mad, I tell you. Mad or not, Flaubert, she is putting you in a very dangerous position. But why should I kill my wife's rich uncle? I loved him like my own uncle. Oh, very touching. But the fact remains that you knew by killing him, your wife and yourself would come into a great fortune. No, no, it is Flaubert, not Flaubert, tell me exactly what went on between you and your wife after her uncle, Captain Silas Harper, gave her a will leaving her his entire fortune. What did you say, and what did she say? Mr. Chameleon, I love my wife, but I will tell you the truth. No sooner than her uncle left the house, she said, I do not believe he will live very long. And I said to her, Harriet, surely you would not do that. You think she killed her uncle? I don't think anything. That's the trouble with you cops. You twist everything. One more question, Flaubert. How are your finances? Are you up against it for money? Certainly not. I make plenty. That's all for now, Flaubert. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Chameleon. Well, thank you, Detective Sergeant Arnold, for waiting outside for me. Did you get anything, Mr. Chameleon? Flaubert accuses his wife, Harriet. The whole trouble is that any one of those hungry heirs of Captain Silas Harper could have been the killer. Yeah. Yet we haven't enough evidence to make an arrest. Yeah, we can't even hold that crook from New Zealand, Marcus Smith, any longer. Well, the main thing I'm depending on now to break this case is a clock. A hideous, hand-painted china clock. I get you. A clock. Mm-hmm. We also know that the Flaubert's and Thaddeus Harper, too, frequent that uh, waterfront gambling house, which means that all of them must want to make some quick money. Yeah. Dave, they're going in there disguised as a croupier. 
at the roulette wheel. What? Uh, my name will be Biff Logan. I'm an old-time croupier, and once during my travels, I met the murdered man, Captain Silas Harper. That will give me a chance to mention his china clock. Well, hey, you're not going to mention that clock. Oh, just mention it, Dave, that's all. Which uh, reminds me, when you release that crook, Marcus Smith, you mention it to him. Isn't this dangerous, Mr. Chameleon? Just say that with everyone battling over Silas Harper's wills, maybe Lucy was lucky to be left that clock. Meanwhile, Dave, tonight I shall go into that gambling house and get still another look at Captain Harper's heirs. And that night, in the shoddy little gambling house near the waterfront, we find Chameleon in his disguise as Biff Logan. And seated at the roulette table are Harriet and her husband, Flaubert. And Mr. Chameleon, in the nasal twang of his disguise, is saying... Okay, ladies and gents, make your bets. Twenty-five dollars on the red. Okay, Mr. Flaubert. Are you crazy, Flaubert? Haven't you lost enough for one evening? If I keep on, I may win, Harriet. I've got to win. What for? What do you do with your money anyway? Harriet, please. Here comes your cousin Thaddeus. Well, Thaddeus? Hello, Harriet. Hello, Flaubert. Come on, ladies and gents, make your bets. Hmm, you're quite getting to be quite a gambler, aren't you, Thaddeus? What are you trying to do? Win enough money to pay off your debts? Shut up, Harriet. I'll put uh, $50 on 21. Okay, $50 on 21. Say, you're a new croupier here, aren't you? Yep. What's your name? My name is Biff Logan. I know your uncle, Captain Silas Harper. Is that so? You did? Yeah. Knew him well back in the old days in Shanghai. I'd like to get my hands on whoever killed him. So would we, but now let us play, let us play. Okay, everyone put up their money. Here we go. Thirteen is the number. Oh, Thirteen blank. Blank. The house oh. wins as usual. What terrible luck. Oh, what are you crabbing about, Flaubert? You only lost $25. I lost 50 25 is enough. Now, will you stop betting, Flaubert? No, Harriet. And I say you will. Hey, whatever happened to that china clock? What, what, what was that? What did you say, Mr. Logan? I was asking whatever became of that china clock that Captain Silas Harper used to lug around. Seems to me there was an awful lot of talk about that clock. What kind of talk? Well, you know how it is, Mr. Flaubert. There's lots of weird talk about Captain Cyrus, too. Okay, ladies and gents, make your bets. What kind of talk did you hear about the clock? Oh, there's something mysterious about it. He uh, used to guard it with a gun. I tell you, he did. And when I heard he was dead, I uh, wondered, well, who got the clock? As a matter of fact, one of his nieces, Lucy Billingsley, got that clock. The following day, in Lucy Billingsley's little flat, Mr. Chameleon, no longer in disguise, is eagerly reading a note Lucy was handed to him. Lucy, I got quicker results than I'd hoped for. This is quite an offer. Your uncle's killer is hot on the trail of that china clock. But to offer me $300 for it... Cheap enough, I'd say. You know, what amuses me is this note. I would very much like to have this clock for sentimental reasons. I was an old friend of your uncle, signed Biff Logan. Biff Logan, if you please. <laughs> that was the name I used in my disguise last night. Someone is using my disguise as a disguise. What'll I do, Mr. Chameleon? Meet them tonight, Miss Lucy. They say 11 o'clock near Pair 61. By the way, your cousin Harriet is quite a shrew, isn't she? I'm afraid she is. But what has that got to do with it, with Uncle Silas's murder? My dear, you would be surprised how often personal traits can lead to murder. What time is it, Mr. Chameleon? It's almost 11, Dave. Lucy should be coming along the waterfront any minute now. And so should Captain Silas Harper's murderer. On a foggy night just like this that Captain Harper was stabbed in the back. Not far away from here, either. You think they intend to kill his niece, Lucy, too? Here she comes, Dave. Uh-huh. She's carrying a package. Yes, the china clock, supposedly. 
Dave, you got your gun. This may be a tough one. I'm all set, Mr. Chameleon. All right, watch. Watch carefully. Look. Look, someone's stepping out from behind the entrance to the pier. No, wait. Wait until I step up to Lucy. All right, Dave, let's go. Put up your hands. We've got you covered. Don't try to get away. What the devil? What is this? Mr. Chameleon! Stand still, Marcus Smith. Don't move. Dave, frisk him. Oh, Mr. Chameleon, I couldn't see you. I was afraid you weren't here. It's all right, Miss Lucy. You rotten little squealer. You tipped him off, Lucy, didn't you? Of course you did. Dave, did you find anything? Here's his gun. Good. Good. A gun, Marcus Smith, can be a very dangerous thing for an ex-convict like you to have on his person. Now we're ready to do business. Uh, what, what do you mean, Chameleon? Marcus, who murdered Captain Silas Harper? Uh, how should I know? All I was trying to do was to buy that clock. Who were you buying it for, Marcus? Answer me. Who hired you to come here? Uh, nobody. Honest, Miss Chameleon, it was my own idea. Was it your own idea to sign the name of Biff Logan to that note you sent, Lucy? Because, you see, I am Biff Logan. Uh, what? Yes, Marcus. I disguised myself as a gambling house attendant named Biff Logan. And you couldn't possibly have known that name unless somebody else told you. Who was it? Listen, Mr. Comedian. Come on, I, Marcus. I, I know that you're scared. The killer is probably right behind you in the shadows. But you have got to tell me his name. Uh, I, I can't. I, I can't. Well, then I'll tell you loud enough for him to hear. I shall bring him out into the open. What? You mean to say that Flaubert murdered Silas Harper? <laughs> Dave, quick. I think I got him. Marcus, you all right? Yes, he missed me. Mr. Chameleon, was it Flaubert? Did he kill Uncle Silas? Dave, did I get him? You got him all right, Mr. Chameleon. Well, it's not very serious. My leg. You shot me in the leg. Oh, that's too bad, uh... Flaubert. You intended to kill Marcus Smith, and you would have killed Lucy as you killed Captain Harper. I didn't kill Harper. My wife killed him. What a liar you are, Flaubert. He killed my uncle, Mr. Chameleon. He killed him, I tell you. Well, Harriet, I thought you'd be here. Of course. She tricked me into coming here with her tonight. I'll tear your eyes out, Flaubert. Dave, grab her. Oh, She's got a gun. Go I've got her, Mr. Oh. That's right. Arrest her, Chameleon. To think of me, Laval Flaubert, married to a murderer. That's enough out of you, Flaubert. You and your wife both killed Silas Harper. That's a dirty copper's lie. You and your wife followed your uncle out the foggy night he left your house and brutally murdered him. It weren't so hideous, it could be a joke. Joke? What joke? That the old and ugly china clock went to the only decent one of you, to Lucy. That the old clock held well over a million in emeralds and diamonds. What? No, it can't be true. Silas Harper had converted his whole fortune to jewels. You killed him for nothing, but you will both pay for it and pay well. Dave, you put them in a the car, please. It's a lie, you dirty cop. I'd like to kill you, chameleon. Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid that you'll never get the chance. We cops have a firm way of holding people. Anyway, what a charming pair you are. Out with them, Dave. And with these words, Mr. Chameleon concludes tonight's murder case. When you take something for the fast relief of ordinary headache, it's important that what you take also provides dependable relief. The reason millions take genuine Bayer aspirin is that they know it does both. Because it's ready to go to work in two seconds, it provides relief with amazing speed. And because it's gentle, you can take it with complete confidence. Bayer aspirin's single active ingredient is so gentle to the system, mothers give it even to small children on their doctor's advice. And of all pain relievers, none can match Bayer Aspirin's record of use by millions of normal people without ill effect. So don't experiment with drugs that have not been proved by years of successful use. For fast and dependable relief, use Bayer Aspirin. When you buy, ask for Bayer Aspirin, not just for aspirin alone. Get the 100-tablet bottle and you get Bayer Aspirin tablets for less than a penny apiece. <laughs> Listen next Wednesday night at this same time for Mr. Chameleon, the man of many faces, in The Case of the Dance of Death. The part of Mr. Chameleon is played by Carl Swenson, with dialogue by Marie Baumer from the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. Music directed by Victor Arden. Your announcer is Howard Claney. Now, at last, you can get an utterly new, radically different, incredibly better toothpaste. 
its revolutionary new lion's toothpaste, and it's better because thousands of laboratory tests on scores of individual teeth show that it actually gets teeth brighter, two and a half to five and a half times brighter than any of the five leading brands, brighter by far than any other toothpaste. New Lion's Toothpaste does this because it's a new kind of toothpaste with a formula that's completely new, radically different. A toothpaste that cleans without soap, polishes without chalk. Try it. Buy Lion's Toothpaste. Listen for Mr. Chameleon in The Case of the Dance of Death next Wednesday night at this time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. This was a fun one. I love when Mr. Chameleon gets a bit of a twinkle in his eye about a case, and he was definitely amused by the uncles leading all of his nephews and nieces uh, to believe that they were his sole heir. Admittedly, it backfired on him. Obviously, the ones who would be nice to him because he made them the sole heir would have also kept letting him come around for hopes of getting that distinction. However, he wasn't crazy. Hiding uh, what was in the clock after it was broken into was kind of pointless as far as I'm concerned. Because you figured out, uh, I think pretty quickly once it got open, that whatever was in there was actually valuable. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it was worth a hundred thousand or if it was worth a million. We're not like revenue men were just listening to the radio show. Well, I have to say, it must have been pretty high quality diamonds and emeralds because you couldn't have had uh, many in the clock uh, for it not to, you know, weigh a ton. I did like that the murderers were so taken in by Mr. Chameleon's disguise that they signed his fake name to the note. That was a really nice touch. Now, on to listener comments and feedback, and we got some... Our responses to the episode, Mr. Chameleon's Strangest Murder Case, which, as I said at the time, was really not all that strange. B. Osner writes over on Spotify, I hate it. Uh, with a little more detail, David writes on Facebook, thanks for calling out the exaggeration in the title. This seems to be uh, becoming a quirk of Mr. Chameleon, where he proclaims something the most extraordinary case I've ever seen or something, and then it turns out to be quite ordinary by old-time radio detective standards. Also, did I miss uh, Dave's use of the word black provided a clue? Was it the association w with blackmail? That really wasn't clear. Uh, and... Yeah, it does feel like there are occasionally some drop clues in the series. Like, I honestly don't get how the wife being a shrew had anything at all to do with the solution to the case. Doing that's kind of a way to befuddle your listeners if it doesn't really have a big direct uh, bearing. But David goes on, The intro to the series had me wondering about his life before he became a detective. I kind of want to hear young chameleon stories about him learning to blend in with different situations. You know, David, uh, that kind of... Got me thinking, because I think uh, a Young Chameleon series might be really fascinating. I think the first thing that, you, to me, would make sense to answer would be the origin of his last name. Now, I suppose you could do a series where you just kind of accepted that he was named Chameleon, even though that is not a real last name. But I think that it would be more interesting to imagine how he might have gotten his last name or what his family origin was, since it says his name was Chameleon from birth. Now, the obvious answer would be that his parents' last name was changed to Chameleon. And how might that have happened? A good answer might be 
Ellis Island, where lots of new citizens' names were changed from names that were viewed as hard to pronounce or hard to spell to more common standbys like Smith, Brown, and Jones. Obviously, Chameleon wasn't on the list, but let's imagine a man who might change his own name to Chameleon. Why might he do that? I thought about this and I came up with the idea that Mr. Chameleon's father came to this country from a place where his family had suffered a persecution, either for unpopular political views or for their ethnicity. And he came to the belief that the key to survival was to blend in to your environment. That was how you were going to stay safe. That was how he was going to stay safe the rest of his life. He was going to blend in. So he heard all of these people having their names changed. And so he decided when they asked him what his name was, he would say Chameleon. A name that would remind him of his overall goal to blend into his surroundings wherever he was. We'll say that he was a professor or a doctor, already had like an existing knowledge of English when he came to this country. Long story short, Professor Chameleon finds a good job and really works in blending in everyone around him. Not just your typical assimilation of immigrants, but a pathological drive to fit in to his environment and to not stand out in any way, which he passes on to his children. As a boy, Mr. Chameleon, I would imagine, had a great interest in people. His father may have been comfortable blending in, in particular, maybe two or three different settings, mostly, you know, upper middle class sort of circles that he moved in. Young Chameleon had an interest in being in more situations and knowing more types of people. And the way he was taught to relate to people was by blending in. And he realized that his clothes, his style, his manner might help him fit into the fancy school he went to and the social occasions that his father took him to, but would really make it hard for him to fit in with different classes and groups of people. So he set out to learn how to blend in, to learn the arts of disguise and different clothes, different ways of wearing his hair, to find ways to transform himself to fit into different situations. And I could imagine him having an adventure where he decides to run away from home and pretend to be an orphan, get taken into an orphanage, and then eventually run away from the orphanage and go back home. And you might even have it be a situation where the manager of the orphanage read a newspaper about the missing chameleon boy, and then later, once chameleon was back with his father, his father read an article about the missing orphan, and they never uh, connected that it was the same boy. And then, of course, you could have other things happen, like Mr. Chameleon wanting to be an actor, but his father pushing him to go to college instead. And then you would have to have some major inciting event that changes the trajectory of Chameleon's life, where his trying to fit into every situation leads him into trouble when he gets in with the wrong group of people. And he eventually realizes that just trying to fit into a crowd constantly without any sort of moral code is no way to live life. And then he pledges himself to use his abilities uh, on the side of justice. And they could work in the first meeting with Dave Arnold. And they could have a second season chameleon of the OSS. Using his abilities uh, on the side of the Allies. You're right, Young Chameleon is not a series that people would think of, but it is a series that I think we all need, and it could be great if done right. So, yeah, I, I, I definitely wish that there were a series like that. Thanks so much for the comment, David.
We then go over to YouTube for a couple comments on Death and the Blue Peacock. And Betsy says, Detective Dave Arnold was just going to shoot a potential witness on the street. Uh, good question. I re-listened to the scene, and essentially when the guy who wanted to identify himself as John Smith knocked Dave over and ran, Dave got up and drew his gun, but the witness was gone. Now, I don't know if I would necessarily say Dave was going to shoot him, although I think it's a good rule not to draw a gun unless you're willing to use it. But if the witness were still around and Dave shouted freeze, most people are not going to sit there and analyze, well, is he actually going to shoot me in this situation? I wouldn't necessarily read into it that he was going to shoot him. Hopefully not. Uh... And then Say Soft highlighted a line. I was in a state of prostration. Yeah, I need to remember that line. <laughs> I might be able to use it myself someday. Hopefully not, but thanks so much for the comment, Say Soft. And now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to M. Cook, Patreon supporter since August of 2020, currently supporting the show at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support. And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. Be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back next Thursday with another episode of Mr. Chameleon, but join us back here tomorrow for the conclusion of the purling matter, where... Johnny Dollar. Your number's ringing now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, swell. Aimwell Agency. Aimwell Detectives? Yes. Who are you calling, please? Want to talk to Mr. Aimwell. My name's Johnny Dollar. This is Aimwell. I understand your agency's been looking for the purling girl for about a year now. Oh, you do, huh? And who told you that? Mrs. Purling. I never heard of you, or her, or a girl. So long. This is the operator. Were you cut off, Mr. Dollar? I'll call them back. Never mind. Call me a cab, honey. I'll talk to them in person. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.